Everyone, thank you so much for coming to our panel, Behind the Features, which is part of the third annual Made in Hawaii Film Festival, happening now virtually and in person in limited capacity over in Hilo. We have had over 50 days worth of content streamed across the United States within the last 48 hours, which is incredible. That means people are watching us from all over and enjoying films that Hawaii has to offer. My name is Zoe Eisenberg and I am the festival's executive director and I'm stoked to be here with you on this rainy Sunday afternoon. This panel was brought to you in partnership with Myth, the Hawaii Filmmakers Collective, Okina, and the Hawaii Films Critics Society. And I wanna take a moment before we dig in just to thank you all for joining us and to thank our panelists, Lisette, Sarah, and Barry for giving us an hour today. Uh, Jeff Orig with Waikiki PD got called away last minute to uh, a production, which is exciting for him, but sad for the rest of us. Uh, so we won't have him today. Before we dig into today's topic and discussing our two features, Tokyo Hula and Swarm Season, I just wanna kick things over to Mary Pierce so she can talk a little bit about HFC. Thank you, Zoe, and I'm so stoked to be here. Um, MIF has been awesome virtual. It's It's been such a treat to see it uh, virtually on Oahu. Um, yeah, like Zoe said, my name is Mary. I'm the executive director of Hawaii Filmmakers Collective, and uh, we uh, focus on fostering and showcasing independent filmmakers across Hawaii, not just in Oahu. Um, and so I'm really stoked to be hosting this panel with you, Zoe, and seeing what, uh, what is talked about and seeing Lizette's film tonight. I'm stoked. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks, Mary. Uh, so Mary and I are actually gonna bow out now for the hour and hand things off to our moderator today, who is Barry Wurst, the founder of the Hawaii Film Critics Society. Uh, for the audience, if you have any questions throughout, and I hope that you do, please put them in the question box below, and then 10 minutes before break, I will come back in to answer all of our questions and moderate those. So with that, Barry, I'm gonna let you take it away. All right. Lizette, Sarah, thank you so much for talking with me today. I love your films, so I'm so excited that we get to talk about them. I'm going to start with general questions for you both, and then I'll get to specific questions about your films. But I wanna ask you, uh, first of all, throughout the question, who were the filmmakers that influenced you to become filmmakers? And I'll, I'll start with you, Lizette. Wow, who were the filmmakers? Well, you know, I, I went to, um, NYU Film School and I certainly was inspired by a lot of like the indie um, filmmakers of the 90s who were working on shoestring budgets and um, doing really interesting, innovative, um, independent work. Um, there's a lot of um, Asian film directors that I really love too. Um, I know Piff just had the Wong Kar Wai retrospective and that was someone who I absolutely love. Um, but you know, with documentary, I. I, I hate to say it, but I didn't really study documentary when I was in film school. I didn't know that much about documentary. Um, so that was something that um, I got really interested in later. Um, but I, God, there's too many documentarians um, to count that just have really kind of um, blown me. I just watched um, Dick Johnson is Dead by um, Kirsten Johnson. I absolutely oh, love good. her. Uh, super, super good. Yeah, so that's a, a couple of my faves. Thank you. Sarah? Well, I actually come from a background in visual art, and I often find that the artists that, in, that influence me work outside of filmmaking. So I've been influenced by writers and especially uh, essay, essay writers and nonfiction writers, um, as well as you know painters. Um, I, I'd say a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker that inspired me directly uh, would be Agnes Varda, the French filmmaker who also works in fiction filmmaking as well. And she's, she's just someone that I've always looked up to both as a filmmaker and artist and as, as a human being, she's really, she's really inspiring. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Lizette, what was the inception of Tokyo Hula? Um, you know, I've been working on a trilogy of documentaries about hula and Hawaiian culture. And I actually thought that Tokyo Hula would be the number two film in the trilogy, but it ended up being the third one. Um, and in making the first two films about hula um, on the continent in California, and also Men Who Dance Hula, um, I had um, started to see more and more Japanese hula groups 
um, here in Hawaii and also had heard a lot, like everyone I know um, in Hula is always back and forth between Hawaii and Japan. And I was like, wow, I wonder what's going on over there. Um, but it seems like everyone's really spending an awful lot of time in Japan. Um, so it really began as a, a curiosity way back in 2009, um, I started doing um, research and development work on the project and um, went on a tour around um, Japan called the Pan Pacific Hula Exhibition with um, a couple of the uh, Kumo Hula or Master Hula teachers who were in um, my first two films. And that was really my first introduction to um, some of the sensei and Kumo Hula who were teaching in Japan. Um, and that sort of really kind of, you know, inspired me to kind of keep digging and look for subjects both here in Hawaii who, you know, might be master teachers teaching in Japan as well as those sensei in Japan who had connections to master hula teachers here in Hawaii um, to focus on in the film. So that was really the start. Okay, thank you. Sarah, what was the inception of Swarm Season? It really began uh, with the bees and kind of similar to Lisette, I had made an earlier film uh, back in 2006 when colony collapse disorder first emerged in the mainstream media and I was just really compelled by honeybees. And I made a first film for uh, local public television in Philadelphia where I was living at, a at the time. And uh, two of the beekeepers that were featured in the film um, have a connection to Hawaii. They actually live now uh, in Kau uh, on the big island. And uh, so I made a film about the relationship between honeybees and beekeepers back in 2006. Um, then I made a number of films after that, and then I just really felt called in about 2015 to keep bees myself, and I started uh, beekeeping uh, in Brooklyn, where I live now, uh, and I got reconnected to uh, Ryan Williamson, who, like I said, lives on the Big Island, and he really became my mentor. That first season that I was keeping bees, my bees swarmed. Uh, which uh, the title of my film is, is Swarm Season, which is this just this amazing um, uh, this this amazing phenomenon that that bees do, which is their way of reproducing. And it was just I was just really blown away by this experience of witnessing a swarm, and it inspired me to make another film about bees, rather than focusing on the problems and how people can fix them, but to actually look at the wisdom of the bees um, and to learn from them. And so all this came from this sort of impulse to express something about the unease that I was feeling this moment of, of climate collapse. Um, and so I reached out to Ryan and, and, and he gave me this invitation to come to the Big Island and, uh, you know, it's such an extraordinary place for bees and beekeeping. Um, and, and so I arrived in 2015 and spent a month uh, living, living there and starting to, you know, to imagine what kind of film that I could make. Uh, and that's when I met the main subjects of my film, Allison and Manu, who were living down the road with me. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Lizette, one of the topics that Tokyo Hulu brings up, and it's, it's very provocative, you address the topic of whether hula being taught outside of Hawaii is appropriate. Having made the film, how do you feel about that now? Hmm. I mean, you know, I think that my my earlier films also dealt with very similar themes, right? Uh, they were um, the first film was about hula communities in California, who were people who couldn't afford to live in Hawaii anymore, who had relocated, and were using hula as a way to kind of connect back to home and their their own culture, and using it as like the center of community. Um, so I think that that's something that as someone who has lived away from Hawaii or had lived away from Hawaii for a very long time um, is something that always interested me. And I never intended to make a film where I wanted to say this is right or this is wrong or this is good and this is bad. Um, what I was sort of hoping was that we could kind of create a dialogue, you know, like, hey, Hula is global. Hula is everywhere. It's not just in Japan. It's also in Germany, in Europe, in Mexico, in Canada. It's everywhere. So why can't we have a discussion or a dialogue about, you know, um, what we hope um, Hula kind of, how, how are these traditions being carried forth around the world? And, you know, what do Hawaiian master Hula teachers and Hula practitioners here in Hawaii um, have to, to say about it, you know, what do they think? And a lot, of the, a lot of folks are participating in that exchange, right? Or in 
teaching hula abroad or in even performing hula abroad or our musicians are very much a part of um, you know, hula being taught at, or hula being seen in competitions in Japan. So, you know, instead of, I feel like a lot of times like we don't tend to talk about it. It's sort of like, we all know about it. We all know that hula is, you know, really massive. And I mean, we're talking like huge numbers of people are dancing in Japan now. Um, in the 10 years I was working on the film, it just keeps going up and up and up, which kind of really surprised me. It's not going away. Um, it's just getting more popular. So why can't we have a discussion about um, how it can be um, kind of a, a healthy and, um, I don't know, I, I feel like the teachers that I met in Japan were very much so dedicated to um, preserving and perpetuating Hawaiian culture for, because of who their teachers were. So, you know, I think that that's always important is, you know, how can we keep the connections back to here and make sure that you know what is being taught in other places actually comes from this place, right? Um, that is what I, I am hoping for. Thank you. Sarah, one of the things I love about Swarm Season is that it feels genreless. I know the genre is documentary, but there are times where it's meditative. There are times where your themes and ideas are in full focus. And there are other times where I, I feel like I'm watching a story, even though the subjects are real, the people are real, but I really felt like there was a narrative in it. And so your, your, your film feels genreless. In shaping your movie, how important was the topic of narrative for you? That's a great question. I think about uh, narrative all the time. I am, I t I'm a film professor and I teach narrative filmmaking and I teach editing specifically. So I'm constantly working through these questions with my students. As a filmmaker, I think I take a very non-traditional uh, approach to narrative in that um, I think that there's so many more exciting possibilities than traditional story structure, which sets up three acts and, a, and it's really conflict-based. And when I spent time on the Big Island, um, I was just really moved by um, the synchronicity of things and sort of um, how to how to tell um, um, sort of mosaic portrait of this incredible place and all the people that I was meeting. And a traditional story structure just couldn't really approach that. I'm also dealing with themes and questions around climate change um, and this crisis that we're in and there's no easy answers. And so, you know, I, I'm really interested in the possibilities of um, ex approaching narrative in a way where the viewer is left to, um, isn't really given easy answers, but rather left to draw connections and have their own active train of thought. Um, and, but at the same time, I don't want to be vague and it's important to me that the viewer feels like there's intent and that there's ideas to follow um, and that, you know, that, that there's people to meet and their stories to track. And so, you know, I think that I'm, I'm really interested in, in storytelling. I was, I'm really interested in the tradition of talking story in Hawaii. Um, and so it was important to me to, you know, I filmed over, uh, I think 300 hours over the course of three years. And so, and edited during all that time. And so, uh, there's a lot of sort of shadow films within within swarm season of really working to find the form and letting letting the material guide me in in what shape it might take. So the ultimate form becomes sort of this vignette structure. Um, but as you say, I was really inspired by um, realism and observational realism. But there's also, I think, it feels almost like a speculative fiction or. Um, when my mother saw the trailer, she said, oh, you made a horror film, Sarah. <laughs> I kind of laughed and it, it's, it's none of those things and it's all of those things. And I was really excited by those possibilities. And I think the, the final thing that I would want to say is that the visual style is very important to me. And I worked with a really talented cinematographer, Zara Popovici, and she has a background both in fiction filmmaking and nonfiction. So we talked a lot about how to develop this feeling of it both being sort of blurring those boundaries. Thank you. Uh, Lizette, we just heard 300 hours in three years. What was, what was your initial tally? Do you remember what it was after you said, we're, we're pow, we got the footage, we have to go through it, but do you remember what, what the initial number was for all the footage you had to go through? Hmm. 
Um, somewhere probably in between three and 400. I think that's, it was a lot of material. And um, I think too, because, you know, I would kind of, I'm an independent filmmaker um, who is writing my own grants. And so whenever I would get a grant, I would go to Japan, shoot as much as I could, run out of money, and then come back home and have to, you know, work on a rough cut to keep fundraising. So it was kind of this cycle where whenever I had money, I would go and shoot and just try to keep gathering material and um, work. It took quite a few years to finish the film. Um, so like Sarah, um, the only difference is, you know, it's funny, I'm also a film professor and I also teach, you know, narrative filmmaking as well. And I do think that, you know, there's a point where I'm like, okay, I have enough. I have enough and now I just need to stop. There is some weird wall that you kind of hit and you're kind of like, I'm good. Um, but I will say I did shoot a couple extra interviews like as we were like just about to lock picture um, that actually ended up in the film, which my editor that I work with, who's amazing and is used to working with a lot of kind of probably doc filmmakers who don't know when to quit, um, was about ready to kill me when I said, I've just got one more interview. It's an amazing kumuhula. We have to capture him. Um, and you know, if, if we don't use it, we don't use it, but I just need to do one more. And she was like, this is it. I'm cutting you off, you know, like you can't, no more shooting. <laughs> so a lot, a lot of hours. Well, this is great. Let's, let's pause on this, on the topic of editing for a moment. Uh, Cause this, I mean, this is the core of it, obviously, especially, I mean, from what my understanding of documentary filmmaking is the, the, the journey of accumulating the footage and shaping it. Um, let's talk about this for a moment. Um, let's see. How did I ask that? Forgive me. Let me look at my notes really quick. Um, yeah, yeah, Sarah. When when you're looking at the the documentary process, when you're when you're when you're shaping a film like Swarm Season, which again, you know, it it it, uh, it has these these different perspectives. Um, do you find yourself at war between the the overall goal versus the moments that you love? For, you know, the whole notion of you know having to kill your your children, so to speak, in the editing room. I have a screaming baby in the background, so we're just gonna have to <laughs> go with it. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the editing process is is the part of filmmaking that I I just love, and I mean, I I love all aspects, but um, I work professionally as an editor. I teach editing, and so my process is pretty exhaustive, and I make you know many many different versions of, of the film. I do really protect those moments, and uh, I spent. The, I would say the most sacred part of the editing process for me is watching dailies, watching the raw material, which as Lisette knows, when you have 300 hours, it's really painful. Uh, but um, my first part of my process is to basically what I make what I call clean take select. So it's basically really, really long sequences of everything that's that's usable. Um, and then I just watch it and I have to spread this out over time to give it my full attention. So I'll maybe watch two or three hours a day. And I, and I use a marking system to preserve those, um, those shots, those moments that I think are, are, they just strike me on that first viewing because that first viewing you never get back again. And so I, I really try and track my first initial gut reaction to all the material and I just log and, pr and protect the, the, those shots and moments. But then of course, yeah, there's those other scenes and sequences that you kind of wrestle and wrestle with and struggle because you know they're really important in terms of the ideas and the themes, but they don't cut together as easily. Um, and so there's those sequences that you just are, are really just wrestling into shape. Um, but I, I really work, um, you know, in scenes, uh, and then the structure changes over and over and over again um, as as I go. And I'm just really willing to fail. I'm really willing to um, go down dead ends. Uh, and I think it's also really important to revisit old old footage that you discarded. So. Uh, because I'm also an independent filmmaker and I'm waiting for the money and I'm teaching, my editing process is really drawn out. So I do have the benefit of, of taking time, stepping away, and then, yeah, I, I rediscover things that I might have discarded early on in the process that are really crucial. And I also shot, I also had almost a final film before I had my last production trip. 
Um, and yeah, a really high ratio of that ended up in the film because you really know what you're, you're looking for at that point. Thank you. And Lizette, same question. What is your process to editing? Do you have a specific mode? Is, is it one of the hard, I mean, I've always heard documentarians tell me it's the hardest thing of just deciding what's what you got to keep and what has to go for the sake of the film. What is your process like? Very similar to Sarah's in that, you know, you spend a lot of time just watching everything that you have. And um, I, I will say though, there, there are usually times when I'm shooting, like when I'm, uh, you know, in a, a, in a mode where I can feel like this is something special or unique. Like for instance, like when we were shooting the smile workshop um, in Japan, I was like, wow, I don't, I, don't, I don't speak Japanese. I don't know what's happening right now actually. And my translator is kind of giving me a good idea, but I know that this is gonna be in the film. Um, so there are certain moments and certain feelings that I think that you have that you know, are for sure, for sure. But how and you know, where is it gonna be on that timeline? Oh, you know, that's where you know, I think it gets really tricky. Like I'm always playing this game of what if. What if we move this scene here? And what if we pulled this section and we moved it there? It's like, I've got note cards all over the wall. Like I'm trying to figure out that structure. Um, and like you said, you know, killing your darlings, there are some things that just don't work, um, even though they're amazing. And, you know, those are for like, you know, special features. If people, if they're like total, you know, people are really into where they can find them, um, but they just don't work in the film. And so that, um, it's not as painful as it used to be. I used to be really, I used to agonize when I lost something or if I lost a character that I loved and sometimes that happens too. Um, or someone that I spend weeks with um, who open their home and their lives to me and then they just end up sort of on the cutting room floor. So it can be really agonizing, but um, it is a process. And luckily as documentarians, we usually, I have a long time, right? You know, my editing process is much, much longer than my shooting uh, when I'm in, actually in production. So, you know, they say a film is made three times, right? When you kind of sit down and write that script or that treatment you have this idea in your mind. And then when you're shooting it, the film becomes something else as well. And then in the editing room is really where the story is sort of crafted. And that's where you're really, um, you're making another film. Um, I know that sounds weird, but you, you do, you make it three times. Um, and it's not until you're in post-production that it sort of crystallizes and you're like, okay, well, eventually it crystallizes. It usually takes a really long, painful process of getting there. And I have to think a lot of, you know, I surround myself with very talented filmmakers and people whose opinion I respect and they sit through rough cuts and they give me feedback. And if without that feedback, you know, I'm not able to, I, I sort of th think all kinds of thoughts all the time, but until I can actually have a conversation and um, get other ideas because my head is so just in the thick of it. I've been living with it for too long. Um, that's where, you know, that valuable feedback in, in post or when you're editing changes everything. So I'm very grateful for very talented filmmaker friends and just, you know, regular folks who are like, this is boring, cut it out of your movie. I don't understand what's going on, right? So that helps too. Thank you. We're joined by Jeffrey Orig, the director and creator of Waikiki PD. So awesome to have you, sir. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, let me start off with a question. Uh, are you able to, to chat with us for a little bit or? I think so. Excellent. Thank you. And if you need to run away, no, no sweat. I, I know you're on the job. <laughs> you so. but no, this means a lot to us that you're here. Um, my question for you, first of all, there's so much joy in your work. Is it difficult to maintain the enthusiasm when you're creating a comedy? Oh, wow. Great question. Um, for not with this team. And I don't know, I guess I've not experienced um, burnout on this project yet. Um, it's just, I, these are my friends and we've been improvising together for I think over 12 years now. And um, it's just us playing. Like the way I describe putting our shoots together is just seeing if anyone wants to play with us. And then we, um, we put it together and then we play. So no, there's, yeah, the, hopefully the joy is real and that we're having fun <laughs> with it. And you guys are, uh, the audience enjoys it as well. Can I, can I, chime in on that last question Please, about yes, our editing, yes, your process. editing process yes thank yeah you. like ours is um we actually because what we do is we i on the first movie i wrote the treatment and then we improvised on top of that treatment and um our process is very much like a documentary 
So everything that Sarah and Lisette uh, said, we echo. The um, one thing that I'll add is that we do a lot of test screenings. So I've been experimenting with folk, like creating my own little focus groups, uh, first with, with people that I kind of trust and then just get their opinion. And then, um, then friends and family, and then, um, and then strangers. And then with the strangers, what I do too is I will record the audience reaction. And then I'll, in the edit, I'll go back and I'll lay the audience reaction on top of the final film. And then I can mark out on the project where all the laughs are hitting and um, where it's crickets. And then uh, we'll rework the edit and or do pickup shots um, in after, after that. Cause like visually in the edit, you can see where all the marks are. And then you can like in the first movie, that's uh, you know, what you guys are watching now is um, it was funny in the beginning. This is according to the laughs of strangers, funny in the beginning and funny in the end. And it was crickets in the middle. So then I had to, or we had to go back and, and re-edit and then do a bunch of pickups. And then uh, hopefully it's a lot funnier in the middle now and, and and through our focus groups we we believe it is but that that's just one other thing that i wanted to add into there and then just one other thing too like yeah uh it's more so like uh lisette mentioned that you know we as filmmakers have lived with it for a long time it's i feel more so in comedy if you we as the creators of the joke like we've heard it a million times it's no longer funny and surprising to us so then that's why I really rely on focus groups and especially strangers. And then I add one more layer of, I have like different friends and mentors that are comedy uh, in my mind, they're comedy geniuses and I'll save them for the very last and then kind of get them one more little feedback. Cause they'll be ruthless. Like this part is slow and it's not funny or whatever. And then um, I'll take their feedback, get one more uh, edit any kind of pickups, do another focus group, and then it, I call it done at that point. Thank you so much, appreciate that. Uh, Sarah, I, I, have a, I have a dumb question, but I, nevertheless, I'm gonna ask it. Your film has these, these shots of bees that are so intimate and immersive. I wondered if anyone got stung during the making of the film. <laughs> Less often than you would think. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, the answer is yes. But uh, usually we were filming with, you know, with relatively calm bees and they knew our intention and being a beekeeper myself, you know, I was, I was always being receptive to, to the mood of the hive and, you know, <laughs> really be mindful not to, to overstay my welcome. Just like when you, as a documentary filmmaker, when you're approaching people, you really, you need to have all of your sensors up and any moment where you feel unwelcome, you know, you, you shift or you, or you, you know, back, back off. And so, uh, you know, bees are very clear communicators about whether they want you around or not. Uh, there were some times when we were uh, filming with commercial beekeepers where the bees were really stressed, where the honey was being extracted. It was a hot day. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the first days that I filmed with my crew, cause I, I was in Hawaii for, a month without a crew before I, I um, decided to bring a crew and begin the film, um, or the principal photography photography of the film. Uh, so one of our first days out, we were we were with a commercial beekeeping um, company, and my cinematographer got stung right between her eyes, uh, which is a really intense experience. And it was always when we had finished filming and we were at the van, you know, breaking down our gear, that's when, that's when somebody would get stung. Um, and that's what happened to Zara. And it, but it was this, this extraordinary rite of passage because, I don't know, there's something about getting stung by a bee that, uh, you know, the venom is, is through your system and there's healing properties to it in a way. And Zara was totally tuned into the bees after, after that experience. Um, but yeah, we, I think uh, our, the sound record, recorder Sean got stung maybe two or three times, but it was very, it was pretty rare over the course of three years. Wow. I think I got one sting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I asked that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Not um, 
Lizette, I wanted to ask you about uh, the difficulties that you ran in making your film. Specifically, so much, so much of your film is during these classes. How was it a problem when, when the subjects, let alone the students, would become self-conscious when the cameras were on them? What were some of the difficulties you ran across? Um, well, luckily, you know, I think because we spent so much time with our subjects, they kind of initially, of course, there's that, oh, I should stand up straighter and let me fix my hair. But they forget you're there. And after a while, if you keep coming back, they're like, oh, it's Lizette, you know, who cares, right? So I think if you kind of hang around long enough, it's actually, you know, not very exciting. So that's where you kind of get the really kind of where it feels like you're, you're in a, a hula class or you're in a halal hula and you're, you're a fly on the wall. So that's kind of, you know, what you're, you're aiming for. I think for me personally, I was very, very challenged in making this film because I do not speak Japanese. I had never been to Japan before. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of, wow, this is way harder than I thought it was kind of um, moments for me, especially in the beginning. Um, and I was so lucky because actually one of my hula sisters is, um, uh, works for NHK and speaks Japanese and she was really um, instrumental in kind of helping you know me just find an address in Tokyo which is not the easiest thing in the world to do um, and then you know there were some like you know that film Lost in Translation um, by Sofia Coppola um, where you I would be, we'd be doing an interview and then the translator would kind of tell tell me what they were saying but it would just be like a sentence and I'm like she just talked for five minutes I think she said a lot more than that right like there was a lot that I was very nervous like that I just didn't really kind of understand what was going on but that was you know something where you know you go into the edit and you'd have this you have to unwrap the, the you know the gift and kind of see what's in there um and get everything translated and so it did it took it was a much longer process for me um and i'm used to kind of working a little bit faster so the language was the most challenging for me and and also kind of culturally um you know i felt i it was very difficult for me to interact with some of um you know the the japanese culture and social norms like i felt kind of loud and gregarious and i want to Kind of run up to everyone and hug them and kiss them Not right now of course because of the pandemic but um you know that was sort of like i felt very different as a director in japan like i felt very careful like i was trying to be very respectful and be very careful because i was you know in someone else's um uh, culture and home so <clears throat> challenges thank you jeffrey i want to ask you about location uh waikiki pd it does go back and forth between the exterior shots, all of which I'm sure you have permits. I'm sure there's no stolen shots in your film, of course not. And then of course your, your indoor set scenes. So, and I'm not asking for a confession here, just in case there's any law enforcement members watching this, but my question is, how do you figure out location? Like, is it at the script level? It's like, we gotta be exterior for this. We gotta be interior for this. Is, is there a way of figuring this out? Did you think about this stuff? Yeah, okay, so, um... Okay, a couple of stories. One, um, I think, to, to answer your question just very briefly, I kind of write to the location first. We're super micro budget, no budget. Um, so whatever locations we have access to or reasonable access to, then we'll write the scenes according to that. And then um, the station is at our studio, so I just have full control over that. Um, and then the regarding stolen shots, um, in the film, uh, we film, uh, here's a little fun fact. We never film in Waikiki. Uh, it's all outside of Waikiki. And um, one of the shots was at uh, Ala Moana Beach Park. And we're filming, we don't have permits. Uh, I guess the softer I say, it doesn't matter because you can hear me at Zoom and we're being recorded, but whatever. So uh, we don't have permits, but, uh, and we're dressed in police uniforms. Uh, in the scene where they're arresting the guy that has the carrots, um, two, or a, a police car pulls up next to us, rolls down their window and looks at us. Um, we have like three cameras, people in police uniforms. They roll the windows back up and then just drive away. Um, rumor has it that uh, HPD are fans of our show. Uh, and that they uh, share the, 
the show internally and, and that kind of thing. I actually have uh, two, uh, one former client on the wedding. We do weddings as part of the way we make our money. But uh, a former client of ours, he's, uh, or a client of ours, he's a police officer. I took him out to lunch. He gave me a ton of stories. And then another uh, retired high-ranking uh, HPD took me out to lunch and he gave us a ton of stories. What's so weird is none of these stories I feel can be used because uh, truth is stranger than fiction. And I don't think anybody would believe the things that happen in real life would actually even happen in, in like a GPD. So. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Sarah, I want to ask you about the scenes that take place at the observatory. Living on Maui, the observatory atop Haleakala, where I live, is, is a no man's land. I mean, I've, I've known two people in my life who've ever been there, let alone driven near it without being told to go away. Seeing those scenes in swarm season in the, in, in the observatory, let alone on the observatory, it's like looking at another planet for me. How in the world did you get access? Well, I, I went a few times, um, and each time I approached it a little bit differently. The way that I got inside the Keck Observatory, which was yeah an extraordinary experience, was I spoke to a communications director. I just called, uh, and uh, you know they're used to being approached by the media. I'm not the media, <laughs> but I'm a filmmaker, and I'm just I was really passionate about the film I was making, and I was completely upfront about the fact that it was about bees and that it was a non-traditional approach. And, you know, I had seen the image of the Keck telescope that is in the shape of a hexagon when I was doing uh, my research. And, you know, I was spending all this time filming this macro photography of honeycomb, which is the hexagon shape. And I just described that the film was about bees and that I, I saw this image. And the communications director, he just he got it and he was excited about it. And uh, he, they were really generous about the kind of access that they gave us. So we had, um, we had a half a day there uh, and uh, a retired manager was our, was our host. And he also was just, he got on board with the ideas in the film and was really great about communicating with, with, the, with the team there. Um, so we were really, we were really fortunate with that. Um, when uh, I filmed also, um, I went up to the uh, visitor center. Anyone can go up to the visitor center. Um, and that's where I spoke with a number of the protectors who were there, who had set up an education center. Um, and then there was another time that we went up um, with the Manukau protectors up to the top where uh, the 30 meter telescope construction site is. Um, and that was a public event. It was um, basically, it was a reminiscence of the first action that halted the construction. And uh, Manu's father, Earl, accompanied us. And we went up with this big group of the, protect, uh, the protectors, as well as photographers and filmmakers. Um, and so we were there listening and observing. And it felt like a really good way to tell the story of this land rights conflict that's been going on and is really important and was a big part of the conversation on the big island while I was there. Thank you so much. Lizette, how has the uh, Hula community responded to Tokyo Hula? Um, you know, we I feel so lucky because we, we actually got to premiere the film at HIF in 2019 in the fall when, you know, everyone could come out. I had ladies up to here. I couldn't see. It was just like, you know, the the dream kind of um, premiere. Uh, so I think that overall, like afterwards in the Q and A, it was like we were having very interesting discussions about hula in Japan, and that was kind of what I had hoped for and what I'd wanted. Um, so it's been um, it's it's been good because I think a lot of folks have heard about the numbers of people who are dancing in Japan. They know how popular it is, but no one has really kind of if you if you aren't a part of you know, the hula scene over there, you don't really know anything more than that. And so that sometimes I think kind of creates like rumor mills and weird stuff getting kind of tossed around. And so I think this was like a good thing that people were like, oh, wow, some of the Japanese students are really dedicated. And some of these um, teachers are really, you know, um, doing their, their very, very best to, um, 
perpetuate what their kumus have passed on to them. So that was, um, I think, really, really good. I have not actually been able to take it to Japan. And that is something that I'm dying to do. And the, the premiere in Japan was supposed to be at the Yamagata International Documentary Film Festival. It showed there, but a typhoon hit that same weekend, so I couldn't make it and did um, probably one of my first Zoom virtual Q&A things. Um, and then the pandemic hit. So I have not been able to take the film to Japan. And that's where I'm really interested. Like I kind of want to, I'm dying to see like how will the, the you know, Kapo'e Hula, the, the Hula folks in Japan feel about this film. Because I kind of, you know, I think here everyone, um, you know, I've definitely had conversations with folks who have seen it. And I think it's been a pretty positive reception. Um, but I'm really curious about how it would kind of go over in Japan. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Jeffrey, Waikiki PD has this ensemble of actors who have such great chemistry. Is chemistry something that actors can fake or is this something you find in the casting? Yeah, it's 100% casting. There's that, um, that saying that directing is 80% casting. I, I subscribe to that 100%. Um, I mean, maybe it's not exactly that, but you can't, you can't, I, I don't think you can take that. If you can, you're a much better director than I am and teach me what you know. Um, but uh, I try and just find the best possible cast out there. And I'm, I'm super fortunate and lucky to, to just have amazing, amazing collaborators around me. Thank you. Sarah, I wanted to ask you uh, about Manu and her mother. Did, did, did they see the film? Did you get a response from, from them and also some of your other subjects, what they thought about the film overall? Yeah, before I started uh, the festival tour back in 2019, uh, I, I came back to the Big Island and held a community screening in, in Kau in January um, for all the participants of the film, including Allison and Manu. Um, and yeah, they they were extremely positive and uh, Allison's rewatched it a number of times and she'll be there uh, tonight uh, as well. Um, and so, yeah, the, the reception has been really positive overall. I'm really grateful. I mean, that was, that's the most terrifying screening, that first screening, right? Because, you know, being, uh, you know, I'm an outsider and I, you know, I felt very responsible for, you know, the representation in the film and, and that the participants would be, you know, happy and proud of, proud of the work. And so it was the most important uh, screening is the one I was most nervous for. Um, and yeah, I've been overwhelmed by, by the support. Thank you. Um, now I'm gonna go to a question. I'm gonna ask all three of you the same question. So, so, so Lizette, you, you're, you're on the hot seat. You get to answer first and the rest of you get a moment to, to think about how to answer this. But my first question is, what's the, dif uh, excuse me, what's the biggest difference between how you envision the film versus how the film turned out? Hmm. What's the biggest difference? Um, well, there were, there were a couple of characters that I couldn't squeeze in there that I think it was a little hard for me to kind of let go of. Um, and I still think about it a little bit, which is kind of weird, but um, I don't know. I, I'm not exactly sure. Like, I think that um, I, I kind of thought that I would have more time with some of the, the Japanese um, kumuhula and students here in Hawaii. And there, it actually ended up being a lot more time in, in Japan. I think initially I thought that half the film would be shot here in Hawaii and the other half would be Japan, but it ended up being like 95%, maybe more uh, in, in Japan. And since we're talking about this, do you believe in revisions? Do you believe in director's cuts? Or do you think at some point you have to walk away and that's it? How do you feel about that? Some, you just need to walk away. <laughs> I think that I, I, you know, for me, it's interesting because I feel like my festival cut is my director's cut. And then I do the PBS cut. And the PBS cut is like where you're just like, that's where you're severely killing your, your darlings, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're just like, okay, I got to get this down to 56, 46. Let's do it. Um, so that is, I, I feel like I, I do my director's cut and then I've got to kind of do a cut down. Hmm. Thank you. Sarah, the biggest difference between how you envision the film versus how it turned out? I think, I think the first film that I imagined making was a fiction film. It was actually mm. kind of a, a speculative fiction film. And 
I, you know, as soon as I spent time in Hawaii, I said, you know, it was very clear that, you know, truth, truth is stranger than fiction, but not just stranger, you know, just more extraordinary. And, uh, you know, I, I shed any idea of, you know, bringing some narrative and, and imposing it. Um, and of course, as you say, you know, the, the film, um, it's very much through a subjective lens. It's very much my interpretation. And to me, that's, you know, the only approach that I can take because, because, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, it's, it's very much a, you know, creative response to, um, to my, to the, to the place. Um, but, but that was in the very early, early concept. And then, you know, as I said earlier, I, I make and unmake the film so many times that, that finally, this is the, this is the only film. And I, I believe strongly in what Lisette was saying of, you know, you just, you have to walk away at a certain point. Um, and so it's almost like that the initial idea is, is just kind of a distant, a distant memory and it's just a starting point. When you're there, is there ever that, that fear of I'm losing focus? I'm, I'm focusing on something that was not planned. This is, this is potentially a dead end. Is, is there ever that, or is there just the discovery, uh, the excitement of this is adding to the, the overall thing? This is a follow-up question for me. Yes. <laughs> I'm curious. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's both. I think, um, for me, there's always poss possibilities and, and you just have to stay receptive and curious and in the moment and, you know, um, opportunities form from, from just being, being there. Um, and I think the real question for me is I often feel like I'm missing, I, I miss, I miss things or I miss opportunities, but, but you just have to learn to kind of let go of that and, and stay present and, and know that what's meant to be, um, in the film is there. Thank you. Jeffrey, uh, the biggest difference between how you envision your film versus how it turned out. Um, I'm a, so we're improvisers, so I don't have a, um, a huge preconception of what the film will be prior to making it. The, the biggest sort of, uh, I think, difference between what I envisioned and, and what actually happened maybe was, uh, th this film was a test for myself to see if I could make a feature film. And this was my first feature that I wrote and directed and produced, um, so maybe that was it. And then like, yeah, we just improvise and I take everything as a gift. Um, one of my favorite filmmakers in film school was uh, Jean Renoir. He's a French filmmaker, the son of the famous Renoir, the painter. And one of the things that he, uh, he made this movie called Rules of the Game. And um, in it, it just started to rain while they were in production. And he just took that as a gift and put that in the movie. And same with us, like uh, we were midway through production and it was pouring rain. And I had the decision of either canceling that day's shoot and um, you know trying to reschedule all these people's crazy schedules. But I, I looked at it as like, no, we're doing this come hell, hell or high water. So we filmed in the rain. So there's a scene where like they're ordering a bunch of cheeseburgers um, at this uh, stand. And if you look in the background, it's like pouring rain there. Uh, it ended up being a gift. And um, we, the, the park was empty. So there was no one inside. We had the park to ourselves. And then, uh, you know, we, we just yes and everything. So it's raining and it's, it's raining in our movie. And, and like the, the, the performers and myself is the kind of the creator and, and like the the guy pulling the strings behind the scenes. Um, we just yes and everything. Thank you. And I can't even tell you how amazed and surprised and delighted I am that the director of Waikiki PD mentioned the rules of a game as an inspiration. Thank you so oh, much. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. I can't even tell you. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah. There's some deep stuff in Waikiki PD, man. <laughs> like I know it's super silly and ridiculous and broad, but uh, Waikiki PD is my response to um, corruption that I've seen firsthand in uh, downtown Chinatown and Honolulu, where police will turn a blind eye to uh, one of my friends, uh, Otto, who has this uh, cheesecake store, 
uh, in Chinatown and he was getting beat up by drug dealers and the police station is literally two blocks away and they wouldn't do anything uh, because of whatever. And I just me as an artist, uh, you know, sometimes we feel powerless against authority figures like that. And this was one of my responses to that. Now, I, I'm not saying every police officer is corrupt and, and at all. I, I have friends that are, are, are police officers, uh, but, you know, sometimes uh, the way is artists for us to to comment on the injustices or the things that we feel powerless against is to create something uh, through our art. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's also uh, like poop jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Well, I have a question now for the, for all three of you, um, and, I'll, and I'll start with you, Sarah. What's next for you? Uh, the film that I'm working on now, I'm just in the early research stages, but um, it's a film about UFOs. Awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Cool. Well, yeah. Can you say anything else it about it? It might be a trilogy because I'm finding it hard to, be, <laughs> to make it into one film now. I'm inspired by trilogies. Awesome. Thank you. Look forward to that. Uh, Lizette, what are you working on currently? Yeah, I'm just gonna say, be really careful with those trilogies, man. <laughs> um, Ten years later, <laughs> I, I started my trilogy in '98 with the first film, so it took a long time. But I'm all for it. I love trilogies, so I totally get it. Um, I am getting ready for the PBS broadcast of Tokyo Hula, so that will happen in May. And I'm really excited because um, Pacific Islanders and Communications they have a series called um, Pacific Heartbeat, and they're going to show all three of the trilogy films um, together in May. So I actually had to redo some of the credits from the first film and kind of had to like open up the, the box and kind of try and figure out where, where I put everything. Um, and then I think this summer I'm going to spend some time writing and developing the next project. I need to kind of take, I'm, I'm taking a break from Hula. That's all I know. That's all I'm willing to say so far. <laughs> Thank you so much. Jeffrey, what are you working on right now? We're in post-production on Waikiki PD part two. So that should be coming out this summer. Um, and then I'm currently rewriting a film noir uh, drama, action drama uh, called Upstream based on this web, like experimental web series that you can see on my website, OregonEntertainment.com. Um, and that particular project is uh, is currently being workshopped in the Creative Lab Hawaii Director's Lab. So um, if you want a little sneak peek, go to OregonEntertainment.com and go check out that kind of stuff. Oh, and yeah, Waikiki PD Part 2, come come follow and join. And, and we'll, uh, hopefully we'll have a lot of fun with that. We, uh, we've partnered with, with, we're trying to up our game. So um, we've got some special surprise guest stars in this thing. So um, You'll find out the real name of Captain Kiave, her first name, and then also maybe the mayor will be in there, her uh, her one night stand, uh, uh, baby daddy, baby daddy, yeah, baby daddy. <laughs> I can't wait. Thank you so much, Zoe. Oh, you're back. Yeah. Sorry for the intrusion. I'm coming back in to lead our Q and A now because I've seen some questions pop in. Um, but so, audience, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the box. Um, but before I kick that off, please, everyone, if you are in Hilo. You can watch both Lizette and Sarah's films in person this afternoon at the Palace. Tokyo Hula is at five and Swarm, Se Swarm Season is our closing night film at seven. But Tokyo Hula is also streaming at no cost through myth.org until midnight tonight. So you can watch it at home. And then Jeff's film Waikiki PD is available for purchase on Amazon. Um, Sarah, could you tell me where, where the audience can watch Swarm Season online? Yes, it's on a streaming service called Projector TV, but it's without an E, so it's P-R-O-J-E-C-T-R dot TV, and you can find Swarm Season there. Perfect. Great. So our first question um, is, what would you do differently if you could re-approach the subject matter from the beginning? What, what, if anything, would you do differently? So I'm going to kick that over to, to Jeff first, put him in the hot seat. Um, 
<laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I'm like, duh. Um, what would I do differently? Oh man, I would. You know what? I would do it. I would have done it earlier. Uh, mm-hmm. I spent like twenty years like hemming and hawing and wondering. Oh, can I? Should I? Uh, you, if anybody listening right now, you're thinking about making a movie, go make a movie. Uh, I do it. Go. Like, if I can do it, this idiot sitting right here can like make a movie. You can make a movie too. And like, uh, go watch Robert Rodriguez's like 10 minute film school. Go learn who Sean Baker is and Tangerine. Um, go find out what Mumblecore is and like all the guys uh, that came up through Mumblecore. Go find out Dogma 95 and like, Go make a movie. All the tools you have right now, the tool that I'm talking to you on right now on an iPhone uh, is good enough to win awards at Sundance. Sean Baker, my hero, shot Tangerine, which is a mind-blowingly amazing film on an iPhone 5S. Uh, Go make your movie right now. I waited too long and I'm like rushing right now to make as many movies as I possibly can because uh, it's like you can. So that's what I would change. Thank you. How about Lisette? Would you do anything different um, if you were reapproaching this project from the beginning? Well, if money wasn't an issue, which it <laughs> always is, but I'm just going to pretend that money wasn't an issue, I would have loved to have um, included Hula in Mexico and Hula in Europe as well, as like a part of like, you know, kind of a look at like where Hula, Hula has gone globally. Great. Thank you. And Sarah, with warm season? I mean, I wish I could have just spent more time in Hawaii. <laughs> I think also, I mean, something that I learned, I don't think it would have worked for this film because it was really essential that we were such a small crew. And I really loved producing this film. And I, I think it was really important that I was the producer. But I think moving forward um, for my next project, I'm really excited about the idea of being even more collaborative um, and and working working with a creative producer in addition to myself. I hear that I produce and direct, and I'm always like, next time I, I will have a producer, and I won't produce my own work. And I always always say that. And yeah, here we are. Anyway, um, so we are a filmmakers festival. That that is really our focus. And I know a lot of the people watching right now, and the people who will be rewatching this panel later are filmmakers and they are trying to make their first feature. So similar to kind of what Jess, Jeff started us off with already, um, what advice would you give to indie filmmakers who are trying to embark on their first feature? Anything you learned that you didn't know at the beginning? Thanks. Uh, let's start Let's start with Lisette this time. I think that, you know, it's funny, we started this um, conversation about all the filmmakers that we admire um, and you know people that we're inspired by, but I would say the the most important thing that you can you can do as a filmmaker is just do you, right? It's you know we have all of our um, idols and people that we admire, but you have your own unique voice, and you have to learn how to trust that and believe in yourself in a lot of ways. I think that um, sometimes it takes all of us a, a while to kind of figure out, um, you know that you're the director, you're the producer, you're totally capable of doing this. And what you bring is unique just to you. And that is the most valuable thing that you have. So don't try and, you know, watch all those great films and, and TV series, but kind of like keep them in the back and just focus on what you want, what kind of a, what kind of a storyteller you want to be. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Jeff, do you have anything to add other than your earlier nugget, which was make your movie now? <laughs> oh, shucks. I just, I did. <laughs> I just forgot <laughs> it. Oh, um, the hell is it? Like, yeah, go make your movie. Um, oh, you know what? The, uh, it was going to say, don't be afraid to be bad. Um, it, your first movie, unless you're some sort of like uh, genius, like, um, oh, shucks. His name is slipping my mind. Uh, Whiplash, who's the guy that made Whiplash? Um, if, Damien Chazelle. Yeah, Damien, if you, unless you're Damien Chazelle and your first movie out the gate is like mind blowing, um, kudos to you. But go look at like any of your other favorite filmmakers, whether it's Alfred Hitchcock, uh, Quentin Tarantino, uh, Sean Baker, whoever it is, their first attempts, and it's not even like 
you go look at their first real attempt. Sean, uh, Quinn Tarantino has this black and white, really terrible movie that is, the, when I saw it, it was on YouTube. It is, I love him, uh, but that movie is unwatchable. I couldn't finish it. And, um, but don't let that stop you. It's a, this is a craft. You absolutely come to this craft with talent and you must cultivate this talent, but uh, it is a craft. No one is born knowing how to hit record on a camera out of the womb. So your first film in all likelihood is going to be bad. It's okay, be bad. Uh, it's a craft. And, and if you need inspiration, again, look at your favorite filmmakers, very first films. Alfred Hitchcock, his greatest films are remakes of his films in England. And it's, they're great because he made all the mistakes in England. And then when he came to, the, to Hollywood, he was able to make these much better versions of those films. So uh, be bad. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. To piggyback on that before I pass off to Sarah, you know, my one of my film heroes is, is are the Duplass brothers, um, very much out of the same mumblecore movement. And I, if anyone watching has not watched Mark Duplass's 2015 South by Southwest speech, The Cavalry is Not Coming, he talks about this concept about, about giving yourself permission to make your own film. But one point that he makes there, I'm pretty sure it was in this talk, is that if you were a painter, you would not expect to, you know, sell your first painting for a million dollars. You would understand that you're going to practice and practice and practice and practice until, you know, your, your craft and your vision are aligned. And it takes time for you to be able to get your craft to where your vision is. And that's just a natural growing period. So yeah, agree with you there, Jeff. Uh, Sarah, what about you? Any additions there? Yeah, Lisette and Jeff really, really uh, have good ones of, yeah, staying true to your own voice, be willing to fail. I already talked about staying curious. I also think filmmaking is very much about relationships. You know, it is, it is really collaborative. And so I think it's just to really take care of the relationships in your life, both your creative collaborators, those people that you trust that you show early cuts to, the participants in the film who you know, are so generous to open themselves up to you. I really, I really believe it's about taking care of those relationships um, as well as yourself. Can I add one more thing on top of this too? Is um, it's like on top of like, nurturing those relationships come up with each other help each other lift each other up for whatever reason filmmakers feel might feel some sort of sense of competition it's like dude don't feel that at all there's like an insatiable need for content if there were i love happen to love game of thrones and if there were more seasons of game of thrones i would devour all of them um same with you and your fellow filmmakers help encourage all of your other filmmakers to make great films. We need to help each other. So yes, all that. And put it out there. Don't be afraid. Like go make the thing. It's bad. It's okay. Put it out there. Let it be bad. And like you'll develop this like mature artist skin that can look at your art a little bit more objectively, receive criticism and uh, improve upon that criticism. Okay, I will be quiet now. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Well, I want to respect everyone's time. We're a few minutes past the hour now. Um, so I just want to say thank you, you know, so much for giving us your, not only your wonderful films to play in our festival, I know all three of them are up for our Best Feature Award, um, but just for giving us this hour as well. I'm very appreciative and I know our audience is too. And thank you, Barry, for your time and attention. I mean, Barry is such a partner with this festival. He, you know, he, he watches all of our award nominees. He chooses the winners. He writes coverage for us. He helps us host these panels. So thank you very much, Barry, with for everything you do for the Hawaii Film Critics Society too. Great. So um, with that, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna close this out. We will have this available for rewatch uh, through our Vimeo channel, which I'll post on Facebook um, by Monday. So thank you so much, all of you, and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And for everyone watching, uh, go watch these amazing three feature films, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you so much.